Good morning, and we have a lot of topics to cover. Um, you have the book here on, on principles, uh, and um, my book, uh, which I looks like I might have, oh, here it is, uh, has a few little marks in it, and I encourage each of you uh, to use little post-its while you're reading the book from that standpoint. And I thought, uh, Ray, we'd start with a little bit. Why did, why did you go into finance? Uh, I caddied in the uh, 1960s when I was 12. I caddied at a, at a golf course, and um, I, everybody was talking about the stock market then. It, it was it was the stock market had gone up for a long, long time, and if you were to get a haircut or anything, you would always be talking about stocks. And so um, I took my caddying money. Uh, I earned uh, $6 a bag, and, I, and so I'd get $12 a round, and I took my caddying money, and I put it in the stock market. Um, I mean, I was curious, and uh, the first, I remember the first stock I bought was a company by the name of Northeast Airlines. And the only reason I bought it is because it was selling for less than $5 a share. And I figured I could buy more shares so I'd make more money if it went up. That was my brilliant theory. Of course, it was dumb. But uh, I, um, it was a company that was about to go bankrupt. Somebody acquired it. It tripled. And I was hooked. So I got hooked on the markets at that time. I uh, was trading in the debt of Northeast Airlines at that time. And really? <coughs> and really? But, uh, How cool. And uh, we were debating shorting the stock uh, versus <laughs> our long position. The debt was selling at a substantial discount. And I think the time that Ray's talking about, if you ever want to check an archive, there was a book published, Happiness uh, is a Stock That Doubles in a Year. And this was a a period of time where if you couldn't make 50 or 100% of your money, you really weren't doing a good job. And it looked at the American Stock Exchange and all the stocks that doubled during this period of time in a year. And it, it basically concluded you should be focused on very low-priced stocks. So that book uh, symbolized that issue. Let's talk a little bit about your family and how your life growing up potentially influenced you later. Well, my dad was a, a jazz musician, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. The, um, my um, dad uh, played late at night, and um, uh, you know he was a good man, but I didn't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, contact with him uh, uh, until he w until later. And um, I was just a normal kid. Uh, we played, you know, touch football on the streets and. Uh, my mom loved me a lot. I was lucky to have a really good family with a lot of l love. Um, I don't know. You no, know, there was a lot of work done on education looking back uh, in the 60s and 70s. And one of the conclusions was the most important thing in education was having two parents that loved you enough uh, and, and express confidence and, and good teachers. Yes, that was my circumstances, and when, uh, you're exactly right. And when I contrast it with some of the circumstances of others, like I was ultra rich in being able to have two parents who loved me and to be able to go to a school in which I was well-educated and to have um, then an environment which was also inspirational in that um, it, it was an aspirational environment. It was the time when, you know, John Kennedy was going to go to the moon and we were going to eliminate poverty, and the United States was the richest country in the world with um, counting for 40% of world GDP, and that whole aspirational opportunity, you know, the idea of equal opportunity and a great abundance of it, and the, our parents, we, you would do better than your parents. It was a different kind of environment then. And so what Ray's talking a little bit about are, are the baby boomers. Now, Ray is much younger than I, but he's still in that baby boomer uh, group uh, today. And this group that was born 1946 to 1964, and much different generation than our parents. Uh, our parents' success was really highly dependent uh, on the government, whether it was World War II, whether it was the Depression, and our parents 
told those baby boomers you could be anything. One person can change the world. And in 1964, the first year, the baby boomers went to college from that standpoint. If we step back and think about that period of time, Ray, on, I was at Berkeley and taking these courses in quantum economics, et cetera, uh, was the only person that enjoyed it in the class. And I think, and every, I was excited because it was like a chapter, a story. In every class, we got new algebraic formulas uh, on how the world worked that we could write, put in, and our computers, our 360 was about as big as this room at that time. And I, when I think about the book and many of the principles you put forth, I think about the advancements in technology, computing power today, versus us writing those little algorithms every uh, class to try to define what was happening in the world. And in many ways, your effort to create a meritocracy is based somewhat on those little formulas that we had written down in that class at Berkeley. Take us through that concept. Well, I mean, you, yeah, you remember it well, uh, like you say. Uh, and we had those little punch cards, right? And you would drop them in. And then I learned what regression analysis was, right? Wow, and that was the key to discovering everything. You know, you just put the data in, and you got the two independent variables, and it explained it, and then, then you understood it. And, um, uh, but at the time, yeah, um, I mean, literally, um, I would have um, uh, colored pens and rulers to plot my graphs, uh, literally operating that way. But, um, and then I remember uh, when I started my business, you know, which was in 1975, I had an HP 67 calculator. So you put the little thing in and you typed in and you got the regressions and that's where it started, right. Um, but yeah, for you and for me, I guess, I, you speak for you, um, I then began to understand that we could put things in equations um, and we could put our thinking in equations. Um, and algorithms, they were called equations then, they're <laughs> algorithms now, they're basically the same things. And, um, you, and then you could have the computer start to think in parallel with you. And that's when it began, um, so I won't, um, so, I would say it the opposite way, though. Um, it wasn't that um, that thinking led me to have an idea of meritocracy. It was that I wanted to have an idea of meritocracy for other reasons, I'll explain, that then made me use the algorithms to help me do that. Um, in particular, let, look, in order to be successful in the markets, you have to be an independent thinker who bends against the consensus because the consensus is in the price. So, and also nobody's good enough to know themselves that they can, uh, all the answers. So, you know, I learned by having, you know, the shit kicked out of me uh, a fair amount of time. I learned uh, a certain amount of humility. And then I knew that I didn't have enough of the right answers. So I wanted a bunch of independent thinkers. And so when you get in think independent thinkers, then how do you get past that? And you, you know, you're gonna wanna have an idea meritocratic process. And then uh, what I found is that algorithms allowed me to do that because rather than think about what decision we were gonna make at any point in time, we would think about what the criteria for making the decisions would be. And, and then if you write down those criteria um, and, and make them clear and then put them in the form of an algorithm, then you could test how they would have worked over history. And that allowed idea meritocratic thinking. And we also had a ways of getting past it. I'm sure we'll get into those. I don't want to uh, hijack that by explaining that those ways. But that led us to make um, use algorithms to have an idea meritocracy to make better decisions than any individuals could. And that's been really the key to the success. It's one of the it's in the work principles here, and it's that one of those things that I really want to emphasize because I think we're now in an era in which when we talk about open source and uh, such things, we're now in an area, an era where uh, idea meritocratic thinking can be then systemized to produce better results than it, any individual can produce. So let's talk just about a specific, then I'll go back in time. I'm home watching the election in November results come out. And as the results come out, you know, things are changing. <clears throat> and it appears at the moment that uh, President Trump is about to be elected. And the stock market 
in Asia, the futures are down seven to 800 points. I call one of the individuals in this room, and I called a number of others. I told them we should be buying everything. OK, not, nothing based on fundamental analysis that I had spent my life on, but basically that when people woke up in the morning, the election would be over. No one would be suing the next day. It would just be over. And after a year and a half or two years, every day, these issues, there would be a sense of relief. And in my opinion, the most important element is that we, the government would believe in the private enterprise system, and, and regulatory would be backed off, nothing else. So that was my view of what was about to occur. It was a macro, not a micro view. What occurred at your firm after the election? And uh, how did you deal with well, it? Well, what we did is we wanted to go into the election uh, neutral to the event, because uh, we honestly, uh, we don't want to have any one big bets, particularly political bets. And so we try to have us balance the position regarding to that. that. It would be a concentrated bet. Um, as far as uh, the reaction of, uh, uh, at that time, um, the real question as we were going into that uh, was the uh, question of how it would be received in terms of capital flows. And it was very clear that it was good for capitalism. It was good for capital flows, and lower taxation uh, would be good. Now, the issue of protectionism um, and those other issues uh, were also, uh, you know, issues. And so we tried not to bet on politics, um, but it, uh, and we should probably get into the discussion of the markets and what the particulars of the policies are in terms of their implications. But um, we wanted basically to bit largely go in neutral, and then there was the... Um, the issue of um, certainly it's great that we're going into a capitalist environment. Certainly it's great that we're going to making money is a good thing. It's certainly great for uh, taxes. Um, stocks are going to be worth more because of the fact that um, uh, your taxation is lower. Um, it's, it's great in those regards. And then there were the issues of what does that mean for the fragmentation of um, we're in a populist environment. What does that mean for conflict? Um, what is that going to also uh, mean in terms of protectionism? And so as we got down to the nitty gritty, it was very much a company by company situation. You know, if you were a multinational company operating in certain kind of environments, it, it was a bad thing in one respect. So anyway, we tried to go in pretty much neutral to it. So let's go back. Um, for me, the Watts riots uh, happen, I go back to Berkeley. I write down this formula. It's 1965. Um, and basically, I concluded that if we're going to have prosperity, jobs, whatever it might be, we needed to create financial technologies that would serve as a multiplier on the world's largest asset, human capital, world's second largest asset, social capital, and then real assets. And so I'm thinking about these things. And Gary Becker, I uh, wrote a paper in 1966 called Why Irrational Behavior Could Be Rational. So I was thinking about people that were participating in, in these insurrections in the United States uh, that would wake up in the morning, didn't have a job, etc. But I was so focused on this element of bringing financial leverage, financial technology to people that had ability and thinking about how to deploy them. And so at the time, in 1972, I went to uh, Singapore. And my objective was to sit down with Lee Kuan Yew uh, and talk about a country that was about to be built on human capital, attracting the best and brightest from around the world to come, number one. And number two, <clears throat> to provide stability, he had to educate his own population so they wouldn't be second-class citizens to expats. To me, in many ways, his ideas for a country reflected in some ways of your ideas for a company. Am I right? Am I wrong? There are a lot of similarities in that um, the man was a very strong man. And he was in a position, as he describes, um, if you don't know Lee Kuan Yew, he's a remarkable man, because he took basically a mosquito-invested backwater 
uh, in which he's in the middle of the heroin uh, drug trade triangle. And he created a vision um, and built out that vision in which it would be the place in Asia that companies wanted to be in, that families could be raised in from people from around the world. And in order to do that, he had to uh, have um, what I would vision in which there was a firmness of the type of behavior that was necessary so that there was a strictness in terms of a definition of what a good citizen was. And he built out that good citizenship. And at the same time, um, he did that in a way which uh, respected all the different cultures so, uh, and, their, and the, divergent, the differences in people. So people from all over Asia could be educated and continue to speak their language and be educated in their language as well as English. And so I respect the, his diversity. I respect um, his idea meritocratic way among those decision makers. And I respect the, 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 the notion of good citizenship at the same time as there's um, you know, that sort of discipline at the same time as that there's this egalitarian way of operating to bring people up. So yeah, uh, I mean, uh, to be compared with uh, Lee Kuan Yew is a tremendous honor because to me, I, I, I look, he's been a hero from, I think he's probably the greatest leader of the last you know, 50 or 100 years. He's certainly one of them. Um, and so I guess the fact that I admire him, and, and we, I've gotten, I got to know him. I, I've had him, um, you know, dinner in my house and talking about such things, which was a great honor, not talking about, but gathering information from him in terms of his perspective. And I would say we have a lot of common about values, yes, sir. Uh, there's a lot of common about values, and how to then run an organization that way. So when I... Um when I look at Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew, as we've discussed with a number of you over the years, it was mirroring what I was focused on in finance. We would finance and focused on, can we provide capital people with ability and let them create jobs, et cetera. So if you go back and look at, as we looked at many times, Singapore versus Jamaica, both of them were separating from the UK at the same time. They both had the same GDP in 1960. There was no difference. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew actually went to Jamaica to talk to the leader to discuss what his strategy was. Uh, the strategy of, of Jamaica was tourism and natural resources. The strategy of Singapore was human capital. And this essentially was our concept and idea. Gary Becker eventually won a Nobel Prize for this in 1992. And so if you look at them today, no one uh, would compare today uh, Jamaica and Singapore. And so this is an example how it worked at, uh, for a country, but Ray's going you know, give us a little more ideas of how it worked for a company called Bridgewater and this meritocracy that was created. But based on the ability of individuals, which was the world's largest, I want to take us back to the mid-1970s and a number of you over the years have heard me talk about the 1974 period, by far the most important, in my opinion, uh, post the Depression, if you're going to go into finance, analyze what happened. But definitely the most important period since World War II. And so the stock market went down 50 percent. Interest rates doubled. You had credit controls. Banks weren't even allowed to loan money to new customers. Unemployment rate doubled. All financial markets were shut down. The business week ran stories. No one will ever buy a stock again. But one of the keys that I want you to talk about was the nifty 50. So all of you who are responsible for managing money for your pension funds, endowments, et cetera, today, this was a period of time where you could just buy stocks and hold them forever, the nifty 50, these 50 stocks. And they sold at an average P.E. multiple uh, in 1972 at the height of 66 times. That was the average P.E. multiple at the time. And if you gave your money to a trust bank, J.P. Morgan or whoever, this is what they bought for you. Well, this was a difficult. There were some great companies, Eli Lilly, Walmart, et cetera, Disney. But there were some more difficult companies, obviously, Polaroid and others in this group. And adjusted for inflation, 
you lost 46% of your money. And so this was kind of the end. If putting your money out safe results in you only losing 46% of your money, uh, the, the explosion in growth of the money management business, eventually hedge fund business, uh, began. How did 1974 factor into your thinking at that time? Well, so, you know, there's the, there was the Nifty 50, and then there's the and then the bubble 74. So, I mean, in the bust of 74. So, um, let me comment on them separately. Um, the Nifty 50 is a was a phenomenon that has repeated over and over and over again because it's the nature of the markets. So it would be the dot com bubble of 1999, 2000, and it, it and it can to some extent be the lesson that might be relevant today, and that is the the notion that. Um, there's a group of great stocks, and everybody sort of agrees that these are wonderful companies. And like today, a number of companies, if you look at the composition of uh, the, le the leadership of the bull market and the companies that are leading that bull market, those are wonderful, innovative companies, and like in 2000. And so, but what the nature of the markets, of course, is that uh, prices reflect the demand. And so when you get into a situation where people say that's a great company and they do well, and then there's the self-reinforcing notion of they do well because people bought a lot of them or are buying a lot of them, that makes for expensive stocks because the nature of our business, the nature of the beast, is something that if there's a lot of demand, it makes it expensive. And when you get into the demand that people are no longer thinking about, um, is it too expensive even though they're great companies, you have that ph phenomenon and so that was the nifty 50 and there are lessons and you know the reason I wrote this thing prin principles is the same things happen over and over again the same things happen over and over again and you have to know those so that was what that phenomenon looks like and uh, you know to know that something that made you a lot of money might be more expensive and you know it's when the the naive money comes in and they buy it because it's good without thinking about how it's expensive. That was a nifty 50. 1974 was also a good example of a time when, um, you, you know, it, it was such a good example of that. Um, taking my caddying time, and I'm taking 1966 was the real dollar peak of the stock market, and 1974 was the bottom. And then 19, and you were describing it. Site 1966, that time of catting, uh, everybody believed that the stock market was going to go up. Uh, it was, you know, just dollar cost averaging and so on. And then, um, of course, it went down. 1974, as you point out, was exactly the opposite. Everybody believed that it was going to go down. The last thing in the world that you can, uh, that you should go is buy a stock, and that was the exact bottom. So the lessons are that the future uh, is probably going to be a very different version of the present, and don't think that the past is going to be representative of the future. And that's you know sort of a timeless lesson, I think. So this uh, gets at the concept of regression analysis that the future is like the past. And this 74 period, an example, would have been Singer's sewing machine. Paid dividends for more than 100 years. Obviously a safe thing. It was rated investment grade in January. And the bonds were issued. Goldman Sachs sold bonds. And the big argument in January is, should I buy it at an 818? Should I buy it in an 822? What is the right yield to buy the debt? Interest rates were higher than today. People at the end of the year were selling this security between 30, 40 cents on the dollar. They weren't asking about four basis points, uh, give or take a thousand, uh, what's the bid? And so something happened, and it was just kind of maybe the discovery that maybe women in the emancipation of the 1970s wouldn't be all at home sewing. And so this conventional wisdom, let's take us to today, and before we go back in history, Ray. Conventional wisdom. Let's see. If you knew that uh, the president of Brazil was going to be impeached, if you knew that they were going to indict the previous president, if you knew that the largest company in Brazil, Petrobras, was going to have all these issues, and you knew there was a Zika epidemic, inflation runnings unbelievably high, unemployment doubling, and increasing. And you 
could say to yourself, boy, could these things are happening in Brazil in 2016. Would you short the market if you knew the future? Or would you buy it or would you not invest in Brazil? And so obviously Brazil, in retrospect, was the currency and the market, one of the best performing markets in the world. Ray, can you tell us how to look at something like yeah, that? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, if you took two years before that, um, three years mm -hmm. before that, um, it would have been the, um, everybody was loving Brazil, you know, and it was very, very expensive, right? If it's loved, it's probably expensive, right? If it's hated, there's a good chance it's cheap, right? There's a saying, of the, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets, right? So to know that something that is good may, may be very overpriced and something that is bad may be very cheap, you have to know how to do calculate value and also uh, expect change. Let's look at even something a little more current. It's 19, it's uh, 2015, and you were reading the newspaper in 2017. President Trump has been elected. You've been able to look two years in the future. He's now in a verbal war uh, with the leader of North Korea. Okay, every day uh, they're doing things. Now North Korea is creating video games showing how they're bombing U.S. aircraft carriers, etc., and having the students work on how to do this in school. Uh, a lot of volatility in the world, people concerned. Should you be investing in South Korea at this period of time since you knew the future? Well, generally you'd be thinking, well, I'm not going to invest. Who knows? They're pretty close. And half the population of the country lives in Seoul. So they have difficulties. Well, if we look at how South Korea financial markets are doing this year, you'll see that their currency has moved up versus the U.S. currency. Their stock market's moved up substantially. Take us to 2017 and South Korea. Um, well, politics... Um, is also something to be fading. Uh, wars are something to fade. I mean, if you look at the history, um, you could take Kennedy's assassination, you could take the, most of the wars that we've gone into and so on, in, including uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor um, and various wars. And um, I think people uh, exaggerate the implications of the wars. In other words, they, there's a tendency to think that um, politics or global affairs uh, can destroy something, and then we're talking about the same phenomenon when it's uh, perceived as something that's not discounting the economics. So if we take Korea, um, if there's not a um, catastrophic event, uh, you have a situation economically and, um, that's going on in, in that region economically that's fantastic for companies and very strong for the currency. So I think it's an, uh, right now it's knowledgeable that the politics is not something that um, is an overarching issue unless there is, you know, the catastrophic event. But there tends not to be the catastrophic events. So it's interesting, uh, the North Korean uh, issue gets more media press in the United States than South Korea today, if you want to compare just the amount of headlines, that's one. And two, I want to make sure everyone understands, Ray is not saying war is good. Okay, so yeah. what he was no, commenting sorry. here uh, was really the realism of what's occurred um, I think we're. I think what we're doing now is a is the exercise that I would encourage everybody to do. Everything is another one of those, so that if you looked at war, go back in time and look at the times that we had war. Look at the break. Look at Pearl Harbor, Harbor, and what happened in terms of that. Look at the European wars. In other words, the worst ones, um, and then say how did they hap How did they occur in the past? in order to gain a perspective. Because what you're bringing to the table right now is the notion of the same things happening over and over again and the lessons from history. And that's the exercise. Everything is another one of those that happens over and over again. So just w whenever you're thinking about one of those, if you just go back and say what happened, it'll help 
uh, to give some sort of perspective. So I just want to paraphrase, if I could, for a second. Right? Where, where, the lesson that Ray is giving us on this subject is study history, look at what's occurred, then try to figure out how it reflects today. And what I found, if I go back to 65, so I check out this book, I had to have it sent to me, called Long-Term Corporate Bond Experience. And I discover an unbelievable thing that Heckman, head of the Cleveland Reserve, had done. He had tracked the history of every single bond issued from 1900 to 1944, and what happened to it. So this data was available to everybody, and what do you learn? You learn that everything that people are saying about credit is wrong, everything. The worst credit is sovereign debt, yet everybody said it was best. And every country was rated AAA, even Venezuela. Second, you learn that the second weakest credit was individuals, they default. And then the best credit was small and medium companies and, and, and large companies. And that the spreads were too wide even during the Depression. Now, this fact was available to everybody. No computers, unbelievable job to have to keep track of everything for 44 years. Then it's updated uh, from 44 into the 1960s by someone else. And I think one of the things you're seeing in Ray and his firm is this understanding, at least that you understand history and what occurred and how I, does it reflect the future. I think, uh, I think then you ask yourself, what is the most analogous period in history? And I would say 1937 is the most analogous period in history to where we are today. Um, just take a moment if you, if you want to take a moment on that. Um, so analogous in the following sense. Um, in 1929 to 1932, uh, we had a debt crisis was, which was uh, similar to the debt crisis that we had in 2008-2009. Uh, then you get to hit zero interest rates. And so when you hit zero interest rates, the Federal Reserve can't any longer ease monetary policy by lowering interest rates. So it had to expand its balance sheet, in other words, essentially print money, and buy financial assets to, to put those financial assets up and put more liquidity in the system. So as a result, um, 1932 to 1937 was very similar to 2009 to the present period of time. And during that period of time, there was um, a, a big rise also in the wealth gap. Uh, right now, the top one-tenth of one percent of the population's net worth is equal to the bottom 90% combined. And if you look at that income gap, you would have to go back to 1935 to 1940. So we had a situation which was somewhat analogous. And then in 1937, as in now, the Federal Reserve began to tighten monetary policy. I'm not saying, by the way, the same thing is going to happen. I hope that there's a lesson to be no, no, learned by that. But there was asymmetric risk. And so what we have is... For some of the audience that doesn't remember vividly what happened to financial markets in the 37 period, why don't you just review it with it for a moment? Well, this, the stock market, <clears throat> stock market went down 50%. Um, and we had what, what was then the first time we call a recession, which was <laughs> like a re-depression. And that's, that's the, in a sense, that. And what had happened was... And we had the beginning of populism around the world. So that was populism that was not a term that we're used to using here. It's a relatively modern term, but it was a popular it was a term that existed back over then. And because that meant we had strong leaders who were um, also nationalistic leaders um, who were more confrontational by nature. And we also then had that wealth gap. So one could imagine that if we had a downturn now, we don't want a downturn, but if we were to have a downturn, I don't think we'll have one, but if we were to have a downturn, I think that that would cause a lot of social and political conflict. In other words, there's a wealth conflict, there's that kind of environment. So we had that kind of an environment, a more a, an environment of greater conflict. So I think it's, an, it's interesting that it's analogous. I would say if you look at populism, um, when we started to see populism, populism, it's, I'm not just referring I'm, I'm referring to the phenomenon, not just the people. 
the phenomenon grows in a certain way and to study it. I, there's something I put on LinkedIn if people are interested. It's a case study of 14 different populism. What is populism? How does it grow? How does it behave? 14 cases, and then what is its archetypical? But if you're looking at it, it lies beneath the surface in Europe. It lies beneath the surface elsewhere, and it's one of those things that we have to be careful of. And so economically, I think, as we talk about the issues of our time, we have uh, the wealth and opportunity gap, which is a phenomenon that we uh, that is analogous, and we have to have some of those uh, pay some of those uh, pay attention to that. I'm only bringing this up because you were uh, referring to the same things happening over and over again, and then looking at a particular period. And I think that begs the question: Okay, so what is the analogous period to today? So I think the institute, in many ways, was created with the idea. Okay, we have a problem, how are we going to solve it? And if you look back at the late 1970s, and I know Sri is here today, uh, we saw that uh, sovereign debt, that people were willing to buy sovereign debt at 25 basis points more than IBM's debt. So we uh, try to discourage anyone from investing in that. And, uh, Iran in the 1970s, uh, you got 25 basis points more than U.S. Treasury bills. That was your alternative. Then they had a change of management in Iran, and the new management didn't recognize the liabilities of the old management uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but this buildup that we saw, uh, there was no way for it to continue, but it was essentially financed by the banks and an outgrowth of this petrodollars of the mid-1970s that were deposited. And if you looked at history of sovereign debt, and you had a couple different elements occurring at this time, I want to take it back to Ray in 1980, 1982. You had the head of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, who believed no country ever defaulted. Well. That might be true in Jupiter, but not in the United States. He had a disciple, Walter Riston, who wrote a book which I'd suggest to you called Risk and Other Four-Letter Words. Uh, but he believed in it also, and essentially almost brought down the entire banking system, who the world eventually lost a trillion dollars in sovereign debt. And so it wasn't until the mid-'80s, Shri, that we started. We then went out and hired everyone early mid-80s, who issued all this debt to now refinance it. And uh, at that time, so we were focused on, OK, what are we going to do about Mexico? How are we going to refinance Mexico? And our conclusion, Ray, was that a 99-year lease on Baja to develop Baja was worth than, more than all the debt of Mexico. And Mexican and nationals had more money deposited in the United States than the debt of Mexico. So we were preparing to offer to pay off the debt of Mexico. You had predicted the same thing occurring late 70s, early 80s. Take us back to that point in time. What are the lessons learned? It, uh, uh, well, it was, yeah, it, was, uh, it was my biggest lesson at the time. Uh, so yeah, I went through the calculations. Uh, and it was a very controversial point of view that these countries would not be able to pay their debts. And um, events started to transpire. Um, and Mexico defaulted um, in August of 1982. And because I had anticipated that, and uh, I got a lot of attention, I was you know, a young guy, and I was asked to uh, speak to Congress and explain to them what was going on. And I was on Wall Street Week. And uh, If you want to see Ray, you can go to a YouTube video. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, from a I, TED talk that you could see him t testifying. Yeah, t uh, go to the TED talk. It's, yeah. You'll see that moment. Um, and that moment, um, I'm testifying to Congress. I'm Wall on Wall Street Week. And I figure we're going to have a hell of a debt crisis and the economy is going down. And that was the exact bottom in the stock market. I couldn't have been more wrong. I, I, I was so wrong. I had to. I had a small company then. I had, um, I think it was probably like seven, eight people or so. These were close people. I had to let them go. I was um, so broke that I had to borrow four thousand dollars from my dad 
to help to pay for my family bills. This was one of the most painful experiences. How much money were you managing at that time? Oh, I mean, nothing, at the, you know, I, I, can't, I can't remember, but not much. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I scrapped myself up to that point. And, um, and it was the most painful and probably the best, most valuable experience I ever had in my life because it changed my approach to decision making. You know, I went from thinking um, I'm right to thinking, how do I know I'm right? Um, it gave me the humility that I needed to balance with my audacity. It made me start to think, um, it made me want to find out the smartest people who disagreed with me and to understand their reasoning, you know, have thoughtful disagreement. It led to me, it was the reason we wanted to make this idea of meritocracy. It was the main reason. Like, give me the smartest people I can have around me, and let's have those arguments, and how do we get past those? And it led to the idea of meritocratic. And it was really from that point forward that that, to ha knowing how to balance risk, like you s we talked about going into the Trump election, trying to make sure you balance risk, but also it taught me about looking at history, that the surprises that I had were um, things that happened in, in history but never happened in my lifetime before. Like in, in um, I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in 1971 when the dollar was floated. And so I walked on the floor, floor of the stock exchange and people wouldn't accept dollars in the money. And uh, I, I figured, okay, we're at major crisis. And, uh, um, and the stock market went up and I thought it was gonna go down a lot. You know, this is when I was, um, in college, um, and um, and I realized that it, when I went back, that there were devaluations that happened not in my lifetime before, but happened before. So it was to know that everything happens over and over again. This the, these were the lessons. Lessons are the ability to have thoughtful disagreement. Uh, so to raise the probabilities of being right, to find the smartest people who disagree with you and understand their reasoning, to know how to balance the bets well so that there's no one bet that becomes an important thing and, and you become dominated in an election or anything else, and also to, to go to history. That if, you, if things happened in the past or in some other country and you don't understand them, then you're going to be in trouble. So you need to have timeless rules and universal rules. So we have a criteria that every, all of our decision rules have got to be timeless and universal. So those are the lessons that I talk, took out of that very painful experiences. And that's really what has served me and Bridgewater well since then. So one, there's a lesson to be learned. If you're going to make mistakes, make them early <laughs> uh, in your life. Uh, um, it was interesting. I actually saw Ray on television. It was broadcast, his appearance. Oh, you did? At the time. And what this did is it formed us and myself to feel, okay, this is reinforcing our views, and this is going to be a great opportunity. Because the banks had been lending money, keeping it going, even though Mexico defaulted. If you wanted to trade sovereign debt in the 19, early 1980s, you had to pretend it was worth 100 cents on the dollar because they didn't have to mark it down. And so if you wanted to, if you believed you wanted to swap Honduras for Nicaragua, you had to create like a chef salad, a combination of different securities because they all pretended they were par. And it really wasn't until a little later in the 80s. But this told us, okay, this is an opportunity for us to use our skills, not only to refinance or rebuild companies, but to rebuild countries and change their capital structure, let them exchange their debt for ownership in their businesses like Chile and others did at the time. And I want to go back and really reinforce something Ray is saying here, and that is dealing with this issue of conventional wisdom and history. So to me, um, if you look back to the 20th century, one of the fundamental things that changed the 20th century for every single person was Sputnik going up. And I was in uh, elementary school here in California. And I know when I was debating a number of years ago, Putnik on whether Russian capitalism or uh, Western capitalism was better on Russian TV, uh, he would correct me to let me know it was uh, Sputnik, not Sputnik. But that was the day the Soviet Union thought this was their finest hour. 
They overcame everything. They were scientifically superior. It was the middle of the Cold War, bomb shelters, etc. But that would mark the day, the end, the end of the Soviet Union. Because it woke the United States up. NASA was formed. DARPA was formed. DARPA was formed so the United States would never be behind in science again. Uh, and the U.S. economy relative was like the U.S. versus New Jersey. So ultimately, uh, Russia ultimately could not compete, and it was finished with Reagan and Star Wars, where he says, okay, we're going to go spend a trillion dollars. Well, that was not an opportunity for the Soviet Union, so it really woke him up. And so I think one of the points that Ray has made here, I just want to reinforce when you read this book and look at it, is to learn from things, and conventional wisdom, as Ray pointed out, uh, makes it very hard. In the early 1970s, there was everything, the market was perfect, uh, et cetera, in the academic circles. Ray, let's talk about one of the challenges I want to just jump off here. Uh, we just had our Asian summit in Singapore, and for many of the reasons you cited, the Milken Institute decided we would put our headquarters in Asia and Singapore, not in China, not in Japan, uh, not in India, et cetera. Uh, but we had of our group, which today that group of people that have their own money, uh, have between 20 and 30 trillion in assets, and about 15 trillion was represented. Many of these institutions today, Ray, are not putting out a million, they're putting out a billion. Or they're putting out 10 billion or 20. And in the case of PIF, and we'll be launching the Milken Institute uh, Middle East Summit in February, and we were visiting with them, they put out 45 billion into just one fund and 20 billion into just another fund. Uh, you're one of the world's largest money managers, the world's largest hedge fund. How much do you believe your meritocracy, the way you operate, how, how much in assets do you believe you could deploy today? Uh, let me break, uh, to answer your question, this alpha and this beta, uh, okay? Um, and then we're dealing with the, the general question of liquidity. Um, alpha's a zero-sum game. So, so I, I'm, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and, and just sort of explain that. Alpha, uh, everybody has to start with a strategic asset allocation mix. And how do they come up with that strategic asset allocation mix? that they then tactically deviate from. So when you create that asset allocation mix, uh, we create a balanced portfolio, we call an all-weather portfolio, and we have some capacity in that area because it's a passive portfolio that is just holding an asset allocation mix that is not active. In that, we have capacity. In uh, alpha, um, you have transactions. And um, you don't want to have, we're closed in alpha. We don't want to take more money. Um, we've decided, we've been closed for most of the last 10 years. So um, the answer is we don't have capacity. Uh, because if you manage too much money, then your transaction costs are going to eat, eat you up. So um, I think the, for any manager, uh, the amount that they have is a function really of almost how much they transact. I think we have the most capacity because we deal in all liquid markets in the world. I mean, not only stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, everything that's liquid. And we tend to move very slowly in those. We take positions in those and we're moving them around. And we're at our, what well, I would say is our maximum. And we don't want to take more money. So active management is limited. In other words, I know the, the boundaries of it. And the limitation for active management is, is limited. The ability, the real issue, is how to create a really well-balanced strategic asset allocation mix. Not all that money has come around, largely, because central banks have put $15 trillion of their balance sheet into buying financial assets. 
right? So that's put a lot of liquidity in the market. And because of that liquidity and all of that demand, then there's the purchase of all asset classes because they all compete with each other. So it's, there's the competition of, um, you know, you have a, a zero interest rate, you have a two and a quarter percent bond yield, and then you have an equity yield and private equity and everything has an abundance of demand because there's all that money chasing all that, that, that number of investments. So as a result of that, there's going to be low returns coming forward, and that's going to have important implications as we're, uh, as we're moving. So the answer is that there's not enough for active management. Then you have to deal with the strategic asset allocation risk, uh, strategic asset allocation issue to try to create that balanced portfolio. And then when you take that, you're going to have that in an environment where there's generally going to be low returns because all of that money has bid up the prices of those assets to have relatively low returns. And the real thing that those institutions need to do is to know how to engineer for that. All right, I just can't stress you know, the challenge to our society and importance today. Ray talked about really an important issue before income inequality. In my own opinion, partly today, we're in it with a knowledge society that is built into it from that standpoint. But if we look at uh, actual assumptions in Japan today, uh, the largest fund in the world, the Japanese pension fund, has about 1.85. That's their goal. For all of Japan today, it's a little over two and a quarter. If you wanted to buy an annuity in Japan today, you get 25 basis points. So you could double your money in 280 years. Uh, if you come to Canada, it's in the fours, four to four and a half percent. And if you come to the United States today, it's still weighted average somewhere between seven and eight percent of the expectations. If you look at swapping in to dollars today, it's about 160, 180 basis points. So if you tack that on uh, in, in yen, you're at about four, four and a half, similar to Canada. Yet what we see are these dramatic unfunded pension funds, the challenges to meet them, the promises made. A company like GE, dramatic change here with $60 billion unfunded pension at a seven or seven plus percent actuarial assumption uh, that they are dealing with and imagining what that unfunded pension fund would be. So how to generate these rates of return? Ray, since this is gonna affect society so significantly, particularly in the United States and Western Europe and other places, uh, what advice do you have for us on this area? Well, first of all, um, those returns could not be generated. They, they will not be generated because there's only beta and alpha. And if you look at the what is priced into beta, in other words, there's cash yields, the bond yields, and then you carry that forward in terms of expected returns of equities, or if you look at private equity, what their returns are and so on, ain't nothing that is going to have that kind of return from a beta point of view, and then alpha zero sum. So we're not gonna have that those returns for all those people, uh, those entities. So, and if, so what we know I, for Are our you society... Are you telling me, even if I give my money to Bridgewater, <laughs> okay, <laughs> cut all my expenses, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to achieve yes, that? Um, you will not um, achieve um, that, yeah, certainly by <laughs> active. Um, I, I, if I was to say, uh, I don't, um, I'll answer your question literally from an engineering point of view. Um, if you have an asset, a balanced portfolio of assets, and the return of those assets, let's say, is a 5% return or a 3 or 4% return, depending, it very much depends on what the return of cash is to think about whether that um, leverage return would produce a, a return that's higher than that. It's certainly the case that um, engineering for that is um, an exercise that is the only path out, and, and, and there may not be a path out. Uh, the issue from most of those returns, though, is that um, those returns won't be met. And to, to get back to your question, it also won't be met in terms of uh, health care obligations. 
so that if you take the total amount of obligations for our society that is in the form of debt, um, pension obligations, and health care obligations, it is certainly the case that those obligations can't be met. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're going to have a debt crisis like in, when 2008 we anticipated the debt crisis. We went through the pro forma financials. It was, not, uh, it was clear that the, there was going to be not enough money to pay off those debts. In this case, when we do through the calculations, we don't have a debt crisis, but we have an emerging squeeze. And so those are the promises that um, means that there will be compromises in pension um, what's delivered. There'll be compromises in those things. And when that happens in an economy where we have essentially two economies, and you look at the bottom 60% of that economy, that's a, I believe, a social pressure that's going to be an important social and economic pressure. That it's a pressure of our time. So that's why I believe that, that, um, that the combination of those obligations not being able to be met is a social pressure, and, and I think then there's the exercise of what does a realistic, um, how do they engineer for that? It becomes a cash flow issue, not just a theoretical issue. When there's enough money around to uh, top up the pension fund, fine. When you have a situation where you're actually having to sell off assets in order to make the funding, and the portfolio of your assets shrinks, those actuary return numbers that you need are rise. So because of that phenomenon. We're about to enter that period where the cash flow needs are going to have to come out. I mean, it's going to be such a burden, at, too much of a burden, or the pension obligations are not, not going to be met, or you're going to have the cash flow problem that I'm talking about in terms of the need for the actuarial assumptions to rise. So it's an engineering problem that's particularly true because the obligations are large and because the expected return of asset classes is going to be low. So yeah, it's going to be a social and political issue as well as a market issue for our time, for the next generation, I believe. So just to comment um, here, one, we're speaking on a very macro basis. If you go to many of the pension funds, for example, in Canada, they have net inflows for the next 15 to 20 years. So they don't, they don't have to generate any rates of return on a cash flow basis uh, at this time with more money coming in and going out. And what Ray has commented, there's a number of others where the outflows exceed the inflows. And if you look back at the mid-1970s uh, and late 70s, when interest rates were very high, uh, people thought they were getting big rates returned by big coupons on debt, but it was the reinvestment rate that got to them and if that's why equitable life insurance is no longer an independent company because they had written a number of annuities but the reinvestment rate on their cash flow changed ray you just touched on something i think that's extremely important and the theme at the milken institute this year is building meaningful lives and when you talk about populism or other challenges it's do people feel they have meaningful lives and Many of us, when we were in high school or college, studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs and his triangle and looking at this area, we are first focused on basic needs. Uh, it then goes to safety for your family. And you can just start thinking about people that lost their net worth or you're reading about they're going to lose their job to technology. And as, but as you move up that uh, hierarchy, you get to loving and belonging and meaningful relationships, uh, self-esteem, and eventually self-actualization. Ray, I remember reading and, uh, in the book, and maybe pull up the slide, on Bridgewater's radical transparency and your efforts of creating this within a firm. And here was a note you got on feedback uh, to a meeting from you and the other leaders uh, at Bridgewater. Could you kind of take us back to that and talk about relationships among people? At, I remember at, at my, we didn't allow people on the trading floor generally between 6 in the morning and 2. It was a distraction. And one day we had uh, uh, one of the world's larger money managers come on the floor for a reason. I don't know how he got there. 
And later when I took him to dinner, he said he didn't realize how people disliked each other so much at the department because they were screaming at each other. I told him that we don't have a long time to go sit down quietly in a room and discuss in an ass on pillows why that was a terrible decision. <laughs> okay, we only have a few seconds mm -mm. and we express it quickly and we're on to the next thing and it wasn't uh, anything to do with personal relationships, it's just how you expressed yourself. How could you possibly buy that security? That point had to be made quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, uh, my point, how does it work? The firm is so unique in this sense, and when we talk about things uh, to many of the world's uh, leaders in finance, whether they're money managers, etc., they are not used to certain terms, such as baseball cards, dot, and other areas. How does it work? Uh, okay, so I'm going to give you one sentence. It's a long sentence, but it's... Um, it comes from the fact that I need the smartest independent thinkers to bang around ideas well and get past those ideas, right? So um, Bridgewater is um, an idea meritocracy, that's what I mean, idea meritocracy, in which the goals are to have meaningful work and meaningful relationships. They're equally important. Meaningful work and meaningful relationships, it supports each other, they support each other. Um, it's like tough love. Okay, you can care about a person and you can be tougher with them if you care about them. And it's like the Navy SEALs, you want to, you know. Um, so it, that sentence is an idea meritocracy in which the goals are to have meaningful work and meaningful relationships through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. In other words, that anybody can say anything and challenge anybody. So if you put that slide back up, um, uh, that was the one that you were asking. About. Right. Can, can that go back up? Uh, um, yeah. So um, here's uh, Jim Haskell, um, and we have this radical transparency, and he said, Ray, you deserve a D minus for your performance today in the meeting. You did not prepare at all because there was no way you could have been that disorganized without preparing. Okay. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Right? It's great because if... First of all, um, I needed that feedback because he was right, so that was good. I got the feedback. And secondly, um, if he couldn't speak that way, then he would bottle that thing up. He'd have to carry that around with him, and I wouldn't, uh, and I wouldn't be good for our relationship, right? So being able to speak radically truthfully to each other to get past it. But, and then you talk about our baseball cars and so on. You have to know what people are like. People are, are, are good and bad at different things. Everybody's got weaknesses. So the idea is, um, um, can you find ways to really know what people are like, and can they embrace their weaknesses? And do you do that in an idea meritocratic way? Like if I, if, if, you know, if I came in and just said to somebody, you know, you're not very good at this thing, we don't know if you're very good at this thing. Just because I pr say it so doesn't mean it so. So how do we get at that? And how do we do with that and collectively? How do we acquire evidence? So if you go to that TED talk, the TED talk will really sort of convey how we sort of collect that evidence, and then everybody knows whether they're genuinely uh, good and bad at different things. Once you get there, then you know um, each person knows how to improve in a better way, or they know, which is even more valuable, who to pair up with somebody else. Because somebody may be, let's say, somebody's very creative and not reliable. Somebody else is very reliable and not creative. You put those two together, you have an effective team. Or somebody's big picture and not detailed. Somebody else is detailed and not big picture. They make a great team. Well, first of all, if you don't know what they're good at, you're not going to put them in the right jobs, and they're not going to improve. And so the whole idea is to, how do you mer idea meritocratically, evidence-based, through a lot of dots and evidence, get to the notion of what people are good at and bad to, in order to have that idea meritocracy. And that's been our secret sauce for success, right? If you can do that, because if you also have an idea meritocratic, 
meritocracy that people believe in, then they think it's fair, and it gets you past disagreements. You know, there was a, a disagreement that I had with the, uh, in my transition, the CEO about different things, and w but we have a process that gets us through those disagreements because everybody believes the, f the decision making process is fair. So that's how you put together a team of great independent thinkers so that you can go to great collective decision making rather than just individual decision making because nobody's good enough. So you can get a chance in the book to read about dot collectors, baseball cards, uh, paint button, issue log, dispute resolution. And when I, when I think about it, uh, and how this today has been captured in a computer with the data to analyze. You know, I was very focused on hiring people that had a meaningful relationship outside the office so that somebody loved them. Therefore, they would be better employees. They wouldn't be looking necessarily for love and acceptance, and they would take uh, different opinions and convent then convention. Next, Ray, I noticed this system I, I mentioned to you, we generally told employees you could not tell me or someone else to get bent for one week. Okay, after one week, it was a free, open discussion. I noticed you have a lot of fir first year, second year employees that participate. Third, uh, I think it was very important, and when I think back, this concept that Ray just put forth, and I, I want to comment it. We were very focused on hiring the person that graduated first in the class, who was the brightest, best in mathematics, et cetera. But we concluded after a number of years that we had to couple them with a person that had common sense, OK? <laughs> and so uh, they might not have even gone to college. But that team, and I think what Ray said, and reflecting in sports very quickly. I grew up in Los Angeles and watch the Lakers lose every year to the Celtics. Very disappointing, even though the Lakers at the time had maybe better players, but Boston was a better team. I then went to graduate school in Philadelphia, watching Philadelphia that had better players with Will Chamberlain lose to Boston. And I think what Ray is telling you is they found a very successful formula to build a team. And at the end, team generally wins over an individual. Ray, I want to switch uh, to two more areas uh, today. Uh, as we think about the jobs of the future and technology, you've operated in a, in a financial industry where when I went to Wall Street in 68, 9, fixed commissions, if you bought a million dollars worth of stock, you had to pay a 1% commission. So transaction costs were high. $10,000. Uh, if you bought a thousand, if you buy a thousand shares today of, say, Amazon, if you can't negotiate a better deal, Fidelity will do it for you for $3.50 or Schwab. I've commented to both of them this was the competition between AT&T and MCI in the 1980s, and I went to the MCI board meeting and said, why don't you just go to zero? If everything you offered is worthless, and it's only price, why don't we just go to zero? But we can imagine what's happened to, to transaction costs today. 60% of the assets now indexed or based on some kind of technology that's assembled together. What's the future for people in the financial service industry? Well, I think it's uh, not just the financial futures industry, it's uh, every industry. You take blockchain and you look at how um, that exists and you take algorithms. Um, and so we're uh, in a world where you are either going to be writing code and writing algorithms or you're going to be displaced and lose your job to those algorithms. Um, you know, something like over the next 20 years, something like 40% of all jobs um, are likely to be lost or certainly threatened. And so um, that's just the reality. And so uh, I think the education of speaking, uh, knowing how to write code is like knowing how to read and write. Um, so we're in a situation where um, uh, 
you know, it's fantastic and it's terrible depending on your where you are, right? It's the fantastic leverage. So I would say for all of you, um, as it has been for me, if you put somebody who knows how to write code at, next to you and then you think uh, whenever you're making a decision, what are my criteria for making that decision? and you slow yourself down and you write them down, that's why I wrote these principles and then there's economic, you could convert those principles which are in words into equations so that the data can come in and make and operate in parallel with you. And that is a, f that you must do, that is a phenomenon that in order to be competitive is, is necessary. So I think that's what the future looks like. Um, I think that's where we're heading, and it's in many ways terrific. But behind it, of course, is the disparity that it produces in income and opportunity, and it produces a lot of people who are then left behind, and we have to deal with that issue, that issue too. Um, yeah, it, I'm operating, uh, the way it works is our investment processes, which are our thinking, expressed in algorithms work in parallel with uh, my individual decision making. So it's like uh, operating with a computer chess game. In other words, I have a computer chess, or maybe think of it as like a GPS. This GPS is giving me instruction, and I'm making my decisions in parallel. And then because that's a great partnership, um, I can then um, say, if there's a difference in our decision, why does that difference exist between what the computer's telling me to do and what I would tell to? And then I go back and reconcile it. So I could say, um, is, the com is the algorithm uh, missing something or am I missing something? Most of the time, I'm missing something because what the computer can do is it can process a lot more information, it can do it a lot faster and a lot less emotionally. Um, but there may be times times where um, uh, I'm seeing something that isn't properly in there, and I can take that and then convert that to a modification in that to improve the computer decision making. So the parallel, uh, you're, you're in a world in which that parallel is the future, and a lot of things also don't even need to have that parallel thinking, it, depending on, on the nature of the decision, because it can be done me mechanistically. That is the emerging today, and that is what the future is. So Ray, uh, when I went to Wall Street, one of the first shocks I got was that what one would think was the utility curve of the owner <clears throat> and the management didn't necessarily overlap. And so I was constantly focused for those companies where the manager would think of himself as an owner. And many, many companies, the owner uh, was divorced, let's call it the stockholder, that the manager was focused first on the manager's utility curve and what was best for them, and then second, maybe the company. Today, private equity has changed dramatically, and our financing of this beginning in the 70s. And so we have dropped almost 50% of the stocks that were listed for small and medium companies. Uh, there's less today than there was 20 years ago. Private equity today has significant social responsibilities in that it controls far more companies than are listed today. They are deploying leverage and other forms of capital structure to generate rates of return higher from that standpoint. But with the idea that private equity controls more companies than are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ today, how does this affect your thinking in management of money? So if they're going to raise five to six hundred billion a year and they're going to leverage at least two to one, if not three to one, you're talking about these new funds that are going to be taking one and a half to two trillion a year out of potentially public markets and equity, returning part of it in debt markets. But how does this reflect on your thinking today at Bridgewater? Well, um First of all, from a money raising point of view nowadays, because um, you know you, there's plenty of money to do whatever you want in the private market, so you don't have to be public, and it's a lot generally a lot better to not be in a 
public security than being private security because you can uh, operate in a way that's more effective. And so uh, that's a natural pressure, as you were referring to before. You have those institutions that are eager to make investments, and so that's that becomes the nature of the beast. And so it'll change where the liquidity is, of course. It's, it's having that effect that you're describing. Um, in terms of... Um, the issues in um, in terms of let's say the leverage question, I, I think that that's equally applicable whether it's uh, in a security or outside of a security. In other words, if I look through that company and I decide what well, if I want to. Um, uh, whether it's a public company or not, private company, um, one can decide what amount of leverage one wants and engineer that. So one can take a, um, a company and say, is it, does it have the right amount of leverage to be in it? Right now, what's happening, is, as you're pointing out, is that there's a lot more financial leverage that's going on because of the fact that the cost of funding is significantly less than the return on equity. So if you're thinking, I, I can um, buy... You know, my, if my return on equity is 7% or something, and I have a funding cost that I can match in terms of the term structure of that, then I can have an engineered return that's an attractive return. And so um, the real question is how that's engineered to be balanced. If it is balanced, so the cash flows are balanced and that those returns are maintained on that, um, that's a good investment. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of, of course, mergers and buybacks and, 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 and that kind of engineering, which is totally fine. Um, that will also change in, to the extent that the Federal Reserve tightens money and starts to change the calculations of, of that. If we look at a lot of the support of the stock market and who is being supported, it's mostly supported by those that kind of buying. The public is net selling of stocks. The public sector is net selling of stocks, and so that financial engineering um, is, a, 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 you know, a, 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 an important positive influence for the stock market. That's also why the Federal Reserve should be very cautious about tightening too quickly, because it's not just an effect on the economy, it's an effect on the financial markets. And regarding the amount of leverage, the, the sensitivity of the financial markets is partially affected by the amount of leverage. It's also affected by the fact that the duration of the assets l is lengthened as interest rates come down, because as you know very well, as you lower interest rates, you lengthen the effect of duration and increase the price sensitivity of those types of things. So anyway, um, you know, probably saying more about the leverage. I, I don't know if I'm answering. Uh, well, I think your I, I think the issue really is is more and more of let's call equities are owned privately. It potentially reduces you know, those that are only operating in the public markets unless you're participating in the other parts of the capital structure from that standpoint. In closing, Ray, I wanted to ask an issue. Anyway, and there's a vibrant market now that's private. In other words, you can and all you can practically trade private things more. It's becoming more liquid. So once we have private companies that buy and sell stock uh, for companies that are valued more than fifty billion, it's questionable what is public and what is private today. Ray, in closing, and then we're going to take a couple questions uh, from the group here. I wanted to ask about your own family. So as I reflect um, over the last 50 years, there was only one out of over 3,000 companies I financed where the CEO told me he was in it for the money. And wealth was really a byproduct of what they built and their passion for what they built. And we all know that it's very difficult for second and third generations and fourth generations where a first generation has been very successful, particularly financially, like herself. You have four sons. What are you thinking about for those four sons and your three grandchildren, I think, at the moment? Uh, and if you're thinking, I always think about, OK, what's your legacy? What's happening with your children? What's happening with your grandchildren? And I know so many, and I'm sure you do, successful people were all they've had is source with their children or grandchildren as a byproduct of their own success and the way they led their life. How do you view that? Well, I, I, I was very lucky, in, and my family, I guess, was lucky in that we, you know, so we didn't have anything. 
and then as we accumulated this, they, like me, experienced uh, each one of the stages of going from essentially nothing to more. And they, so they know, actually know what the difference is. Um, we didn't come in with this and by experiencing that. So they- Your grandchildren might not have had that. No, my, I'm saying it's an, it could be, a, it certainly could be an issue for the grandchildren. Um, but by experiencing that, I mean, and also n knowing what, you know, what you value somehow gets carried along to them in terms of like what you value. I, I remember when we renovated a, a, a kitchen and the kitchen had to uh, be closed down and we had to go into this little room that, with a hot plate and everybody. We reminisce about how the dinners were great in that hot plate and so on. So you, you can know, you went to Maslow's Laws and you can know as you go up there what matters. You know, you've got to if you got a bed and sleep in and you got good food and you got good relationships, okay, safety, belonging, community, that's been, you touched on it, uh, community is the greatest source of happiness. This isn't me saying this, this is numerous studies, and there's not much correlation, there's no correlation past a certain basic level of income, amount of money, and happiness. So we know those things, we experience those things, and I'm lucky in a sense that my kids have done that. And then the thing I want to give my kids more than anything, and those grandkids, is self-sufficiency. In other words, you could have any life you want to choose, but you've got to be self-sufficient and, and you be strong. And I've provided them, I don't know, with a lot of tough love, and they understand the concept of tough love. So that's been, but it's definitely an issue, right? The, the problem of having too much money, we've talked about this. The, 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 uh, the problem of having too much money, in many cases, is much more than the problem of having too little money. It depends where you are, right? Community, relationships. And it's the greatest reward, a greatest, I think, source of happiness. And so knowing that, but people can become addicted to these things, and, and you have to be very careful about that. My, you know, we still, you know, fly commercially, almost generally speaking. My wife is like this. We get in the habit of these things, because, and the kids are like that. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a big issue, and uh, it's important uh, to, um, experience that and my grandkids but I think I'm lucky in that my kids themselves get this and like uh, they they're more in many cases more austere than I am uh, I, I won't get into all that but um, it's an important issue yeah so let's open it to a couple of questions Shri Mike uh, again in 1986 when the whole world was shorting Latin American debt you had the foresight to start uh, an equity fund. Yes, we were buying it, yes. Buying it at that time. <laughs> With the credit spreads being so low and the, and the central banks tightening, do you see a 1986 Mexico moment come for the U.S. credit market in a few years? And for Ray, the question would be with you depending on multiple regression, which look at No, I don't, I don't believe in, let me be clear, I think the data mining, a single multiple, I, I won't allow even regression analysis to be done, just to be clear. An algorithm, what I'm referring, I'm sorry for the interruption, but, um, let me, but let me make this clear. An algorithm, the way I see it, is an expression of your thinking. The question is how it's determined. If you go to data mine to try to determine your algorithm, like a regression analysis, I think you're gonna be in trouble, particularly in the markets because you're not going to understand. You could take a two independent variable regression analysis and you, you can't explain why the coefficient, if it says 0.25 times whatever that is, and you say, why should it be that if that thing changes by 0.25, you can't explain it. So I'm not that. I'm talking about algorithms which are, in a sense, the, w the decision rules that you are expressing however you choose to come by that. I just wanted to clarify that. Sorry for the interruption. Not at all. That's, that's great. The one, then the only addition would be how do you take account of tail risk under those considerations? Um, which, what? Tail risk? Tail risk? Uh, no. Out standard deviations. No, no, I think that, again, I think that you're not, a, I'm not conveying to you adequately what I'm saying. I would ask you, how do you take a, a consideration of tail risk? However you do, I'm, I have my way, you have your way, um, that the algorithm can capture that. It's not a mathematical thing. I think you're thinking, of, you have, you're approaching that with a certain preconception of what I'm doing that's not correct, right? So I'm saying we all in, 
deal with the question of tail risk, then I would, if we had a conversation and say, what's the best way to deal with tail risk, then we would derive that, we'd put that in words, and then we would convert that into an algorithm for dealing with tail risk. That's what I'm using that as an example, right? So the question is, does it rep represent your good thinking? Don't, you're having a preconception, essentially, that it thinks I'm putting a lot of numbers in the machine, and then I'm trying to deal with that. And I, you know, we can go down that path, but I just want to explain that it's not. It's a I believe it has to be a reflection of your thinking. I believe that the biggest issue of um, we're dealing with, particularly in the markets regarding algorithms, is um, algorithms are going to blow up if these two things, two, th two considerations. Do you understand the algorithm, and do you, does the cause-effect relationship make sense to you? A lot of algorithmic and machine learning means that the person cannot explain the logic of the cause-effect relationship, and that's the first sign of danger. The second sign of danger or risk is that the future is different from the past. If you have both of those things, where in the markets um, the future is both likely to be different from the past and most importantly, that whatever is discovered becomes put into the price, right? In other words, if you discover something great and the algorithm discovers it and other people discover the same algorithm, then what's going to happen is the worst, the reverse. Because everybody finding that, using that algorithm will bid up the price, let's say, and not understand why. And it's therefore more logical to go the opposite way of the algorithm than to follow the algorithm. You got to short it, right? And history has shown us that that's the case. Long-term capital, uh, I mean, m many, many, many cases. Merger arbitrage, any particular style of investing has, when, when it's gone through that process where the person doesn't know the logic behind it, it's very dangerous. So I just I just want to be clear. I don't think, by the way, that's just an investment problem. I think it's, a, it's, it's an issue of our time, because as we get into more algorithmic decision making, I think that um, it's totally OK if the future is the same as the past and you don't understand it. Playing chess, for example, or even doctors doing surgeries. If the same moves are made over and over again, cutting and making those decisions and so on, so that there's no reason to believe that the future is different from the past, you can get algorithms to do mimicking, and that will be effective, and we're going to see a lot of that. But we're going to push the limits of this thing, because some people, in terms of competition, are not going to be able to tell the difference. And as a result, I think algorithms in, in our society as a whole can be quite dangerous because there's not an understanding and there's the future being different from the past and that's a formula for danger. Thank you. You answered the question. So, um, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have a very short well, answer. Your interruption. I, I, I didn't leave Shree, time. that um, in that period of time you were buying securities at one cent on the dollar to 50, 60 cents on the dollar. Today, spreads have tightened. You have non-investment grade debt sold at two and three quarters in euros, three and three quarters in the US. And so I think one of the areas that Ray touched on in this environment, the definition of a, quote, junk security making up 99% of all companies are high yield was that the security traded more on the underlying credit of the company than it did on where governments were interest rates. With spreads contracting so much, the risk is that these securities will be trading more on the where in level of interest rates are than the underlying what's going on in the company. And so you've, you've brought this element of risk into the marketplace today, which is not reflected, uh, and that is that you don't have this cushion. You don't have 800 basis points, 7,000 basis points uh, when, the narrow, when you have these spreads narrowing so much. And so therefore, uh, the real risk of the 1970s was interest rate risk and early 80s. So you had U.S. government bonds trading at 50 cents on the dollar, not because of credit, but because of interest rates. So uh, next question. Let's, yes, sir.
I, I want to distinguish uh, Bitcoin f from uh, the technology such as um, blockchain and those kinds of because when we talk about Bitcoin, one might be referring to either of those things, and I just want to create the distinction between those things. Maybe, so, maybe you talk about Bitcoin. Well, why don't why don't you? I think why don't you talk about both? Well, a cur uh, uh, okay, um, a currency, cryptocurrency. There are two th purposes of a currency: a medium of exchange, and a storehold of wealth. I can have a bond or so on. Um, and then there's the question of which one. Is it Bitcoin, Ethereum, is it going to be another technology question, okay? So all of those things are on the table. Right now, it's, um, it's not an effective medium of exchange. You, you know, you, I get some Bitcoin, I want to go spend it Bitcoin, you can't use it as an effective medium of exchange, other than in a very limited number of cases, which can also be threatened in terms of what the secrecy of those transactions are and things that are being done by governments to uh, get beyond that secrecy. So it's not an effective uh, medium of exchange as of now, and it's not an effective uh, storehold of wealth. And that's because the speculation on it is such, and the participant in it, um, is um, something that I would say is a classic bubble kind of situation. I Meaning if you look at the nature of the participant in it, and you say, what is the level of sophistication in their understanding the ability? Is, do we have a sophisticated investor who is then actually thinking in terms of expected value, terms of what, where that's going to be and so on? Or do we have an investor who is inclined to then flip it and trading in and out, and what's that component? You can, by the way, have a wonderful investment that's a long-term investment and still have a bubble in that investment. So, so I'm not saying this is a forever thing, but the nature of the participants in that investment and what they're doing has made it a, a bubble of, you know, a, what I, uh, doesn't mean it's a worthless investment. It just means that when you look at the characteristics of what constitutes a bubble, the purchase for resale by a naive group of people who are attracted because it's moving up, it has those bubble characteristics. Okay, and then um, and then so um, and then there's the question of what is the version of it. So if I take Bitcoin and then there's Ethereum and then there's the I don't know each one of those that might come and how will they operate? I would say that as distinct from the blockchain notion of the and the whole concept of cryptocurrency which has a lot of merit to it so um, but as a currency you can't have the volatility driven by speculation on it make it a storehold of wealth so it that's that's an its characteristics right now are standing in the way of its potential. It may be engineered differently to some extent there you know maybe if you created um, at a different engineer. Uh, if I was trying to make it effective as a currency, I would engineer how I do that differently. I won't digress into how I would engineer it to do it differently. So I think it has a, a lot of potential as, um, as, a, as a concept and uh, blockchain, but at the same time, it has these issues I'm referring to. So we all remember when the US and other currencies, we talked about how what percent was backed by gold. So when you talked about what is a storehouse of value, and then the separation of the currency from gold. And I think we see, you just have to look on social media, a number of people that have the most number of hits on Twitter are now thinking about creating their own security, okay, and their own currencies. So if you're gonna come, if I have 100 million people following me on the web, maybe I should have my own currency too so they can put money behind me uh, from that standpoint. Next question, let's take, here, sir. yes sir. You want to take it first? No. You can. Okay. Uh, um, I'll separate the philanthropy part from the China uh, thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on China. China. China has four 
big economic challenges. But if you're really looking at the, the nature of its fundamentals uh, and the getting past those challenges, um, I'm, it, so here it is. The four challenges that, that it has um, is it has, a, it has to do a debt restructuring, it has to do an economic restructuring, it has to develop its capital markets, and it has to manage its balance of payments. Those are the four major challenges. Every country uh, in the world has had those. The United States had three major debt crises. We've had balance of payments challenges and all of those types of things. The real question uh, is, is it denominated in your own currency? Is the debt primarily denominated in your own currency? And do you know how to manage these things well? So what, what we're seeing in China is we're seeing effective move toward um, the debt, restruct debt restructurings. You're seeing, and we'll, after we pass the 19th People's Congress and so on, you're going to see more of that, um, that kind of move. There's a, a very impressive economic restructuring going on. The dealing, there's the old industries, the state-owned enterprises and those old industries, and there's the development, the fast development of wonderful new industries, cutting edge that are period that are fantastic. Um, you know, when I went to China originally and started in 1984, I would bring a $10 calculator to them, and they thought that was like a miracle. And now I'm watching in terms of where they are in artificial intelligence and all of those things, and it's comparable to where we are and, and, I, and, and for, 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 for very good reasons. So we're having an economic restructuring that's very effective. In terms of the capital markets development, Wow, I mean, the, uh, you know, link Hong Kong and the development of securities over the last few years, the ability really to develop the, the liquidity, the depth of those markets, the openness of those markets, extremely effective. And in terms of dealing with its balance of payments, it's dealing with its balance of payments effectively. And the reason it is is because they have capable leaders. I know the economic leaders, the people who are there. I know, you know, how well, what are their skill sets, and and how are they managing that, and they have you know an advantage in some respects in terms of the ability to control some of those things so um, so I'm very very impressed if you take a look at them their, their underlying fundamentals the education of their kids the um, this this move to um, at reform in other words reform means in other words becoming a much more market oriented economy to be, and also uh, rule of law uh, rule of law, eliminating corruption or reducing corruption. Look at the uh, incredibly impressive accomplishments there. I'm conf I feel good about the leadership of China, the capabilities, not only at the, at the highest level, but also particularly on the economy. And then I'm, and I'm looking at that. So those are issues that, you know, they create little bumps along the way. I think people misunderstand China because um, these problems existing, does, a lot of people thought were problems that are going to mean, be terrible. For, for China, but they don't understand essentially the engineering. And, and you, you have to look back and say that it's been an impressive track record consistently, really, since um, Deng Xiaoping came to power, right? And it was very similar. Deng Xiaoping was quite similar to, um, uh, let's say, a, a capitalist, okay? Um, if you say, who, who, who's had the quote, it's glorious to be rich. That was Deng Xiaoping as they brought it to, to China, and that's that's continued in terms of creating that type of, um, and and the political risks are not, not high political risks, so they have to build rule of law. Anyway, I'm answering the question too long, but I'm I'm bullish on uh, China and its capabilities. Um, uh, they will have to change. The economy is no longer going to be the cheap, uh, cheaply produced things, but that's okay because they'll have the capacity to do that. Anyway, over to you. Mike. Most people are too busy doing than to sit down and write a book. And I think all of us, uh, Ray, are envious that you took the time to write a book to capture not only your personal experience, but the principles you've sat down. And we look forward in potentially this third chapter in your life as a fellow member of the Giving Pledge with you and your family as to what you're going to accomplish and how you might change that world. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And we have partnership in that third <laughs> phase of our life. We will. Thank you.